some bloops part of the super conference. So our next speaker is an open source advocate, software engineer, and maker. And while she's spent most of her time with the Python community the last year, like many of us, she's been learning to design and create synthesizers. So her talk today showcases a project where she, the goal was to build a Sega inspired hardware synthesizer from the ground up. So please, hey, she's already here. Welcome to the Super Conference stage, Thea Flowers. Hi. Awesome. Okay. Um, a big shout out to the Supercon crew for making this work, because I have a lot of stuff up here, if y'all haven't noticed. And they've been very accommodating and understanding, um, where they should probably be a little frustrated. So, thank you. <laughs> We're still okay. <laughs> good, good. I'm glad there's a little frustration. It keeps us going. So yeah, um, I'm Thea Flowers, um, and I'm here to talk to you about a really fun project, I think it's fun, that I've been working on over the last year or so. Um, I'm going to talk about building a Sega-inspired hardware synthesizer from the ground up. This was my first real hardware project, um, so that was dumb in retrospect. Um, I encountered a lot of really interesting challenges along the way, and I'm going to share with you like those challenges, but I'm also going to talk a little bit about what makes that Sega Genesis sound so special that inspired me to create a synthesizer out of it. Um, with any luck, at the end of this, fingers crossed, I'm going to give you a little demo of what it sounds like. So hopefully this all works. Um, my goal here isn't to teach you everything it takes to build a synthesizer like this. It's going to be the greater part of a year, and we have 30 minutes here today. So um, yeah. Don't, don't, walk, don't think you walk away from this knowing how to build all of this. But um, everything that I, I did as part of this project is open source, so if you want to go and learn from my mistakes, by all means, please do that. Cool. So let's dive right in. Let's talk about what makes the Sega Genesis special to me. Because I don't care if it's special to you. I only care if it's special to me. And I don't know if you could tell by my leggings, but I'm a huge Sonic fan, and that's because Sonic the Hedgehog was the first video game I ever played. My first memories of video games were from the Sega Genesis. And I know that you're all thinking, wow, she's really young. Um, but it, it really stuck with me. And like video games were what encouraged me to get into software engineering and eventually hardware. Um, so yeah, but I mean, that's what makes it special to me. But what makes it actually sound unique, right? Why out of all the consoles would you want to build a hardware synthesizer using the Sega Genesis's hardware? Well, to answer that question, we need to talk a little bit about history and what really makes video game console music sound unique. As many of you probably already know, early video game consoles were extremely resource constrained. These were essentially like eight or 16-bit computers with like no RAM, barely any ROM, and they just couldn't play back music like we do today. Um, there, there just wasn't enough room to like give you a sort of reference point. An MP3 file is like four megs in size for a three and a half minute song. The average NES game is 128 kilobytes. And, MP, and the MP3 didn't even like get invented until 1993. So that wasn't an option. So the designers of these early consoles came up with a brilliant idea. Instead of playing back recorded music, They'll just store like digitized sheet music and have the hardware actually go and synthesize it in real time, which is a brilliant idea. Um, but it required dedicated separate hardware to pull that off. And that's where these consoles were to get their special voice. So the consoles from the 80s, before the Genesis came out in 89, um, generally use pretty limited sound hardware. They use what's called programmable sound generators, or PSGs. And these like basically just had like some of them just had square waves as output, and some of them just had triangles. Um, but most of them could do a mix of like square, triangle, and noise. It means you're pretty limited in the number of instruments that's playing at a, at a time and what those instruments could actually sound like. And this is what those look like if you have an iPad and you draw them out. <laughs> but I actually want to show you what they sound like because sound is much more important to me. So I'm going to start with a song that I think almost everyone in this room will know. It is the theme to Super Mario Brothers. And I know this, this talk is about Sega, but I have to give Nintendo a little bit of credit here. Um, 
This song used the extremely limited palette of the NES to create this iconic theme. And hopefully audio works, so let's see if this, this happens. Um, yeah. All right, everybody knows that, right? It's like a nursery rhyme to me. Um, the melody is a square wave, the bass is a triangle wave, and the drums, the ksh, is noise. Um, that's all you had to work with. That's it. That's all the NES could do. And that's why all the music for every NES game sounds like it's played by the same band. Um, so, Sega comes along in 89 and they say, we gotta beat these Nintendo guys. Like, we can't, we can't just, just do what they did. We have to do it better. So, Sega was like, all right, we're gonna do something super cool. They decided to use a form of sound synthesis that was really popular in professional audio at the time, but hadn't quite made its way into home consoles. This method was called frequency modulation or FM synthesis. And unlike the really simple waveforms that you can make with programmable sound generators, FM synth synthesis could make thousands of unique sounds. So, Sega contracted the world's greatest jet ski slash motorcycle slash piano company, <laughs> Yamaha, to create the sound engine for the Genesis. Yamaha came back with this chip. This is the YM2612. It is a cost-reduced, feature-limited version of the same sound chip that Yamaha used in its legendary DX7 synthesizer, which is, I think, I meant to look this up so I don't lie to you all, but I think it's the top-selling synthesizer of all time. And you can hear it in literally thousands of songs. Like Take On Me, Danger Zone, all kinds of really rad rock songs. Um, and so many others. So, we got the YM2612. What can it do? Well, it was limited compared to its bigger sisters, of course, but it was still a very powerful sonic engine to include in the Genesis. That is a pun very much intended. Um, it contains six voices, so you could have like six different sounds playing at a time, and each voice has four FM operators. And we can't really go into the details of how FM synthesis works, but the number of operators basically tells you how advanced the synthesizer is. Four is the bare minimum to really make it sound like anything at all. So it is really cost reduced. Uh, for comparison, the DX7 had six and it was considered revolutionary at the time. Um, and modern FM synthesizers have like 20 to 50 FM operators. So things are a little bit different these days. And it had like a lot of other really interesting features that really put it miles ahead of other consoles at the time. So, to compare and contrast, I'm gonna let you hear a song that was written for the sake of Genesis. And I know, I know, it's gonna sound dated here in 2019, but I want you to compare that to what we just heard from the Mario soundtrack. This was a huge leap forward, so let's listen. <laughs> That was rad, right? Okay, I didn't, I didn't write that song. Uh, so yeah, like just in that short clip, we heard like so many different sounds, so many unique sounds. And what was amazing about the Genesis is like the next level that you played would be just completely different, and it would sound completely different, and it was amazing. And it also sounded like what music sounded like at the time. It didn't sound like dated or limited. It actually sounded like there was you know, a band in your living room. It's really, really cool. So, that's all awesome. But this sort of Genesis being the king of audio didn't last for long. The PlayStation was released and ruined everything. It brought CD playback, so audio hardware, like the YM2612, basically became irrelevant, because then we could just play back pre-recorded audio through the CD. So the Genesis really happened at this special moment in time where it still made sense to include dedicated hardware to make sound and the hardware had advanced enough to do something like awesome like FM synthesis. And then right afterwards, CDs came along. So that's what gives it such a unique and awesome voice. All right, so I love the Genesis and hopefully you all do now. If you don't, we can't be friends. I wanted to use the Genesis to make some music. 
And while there was an easy way out of this, it's called VSTs, virtual, virtual instruments, basically. You just download something and you put it into your, to Ableton Live and you're good to go. I could do the easy route, but I am hard-headed. So I said, let's build a hardware synthesizer for this because that's way more fun. Um, it'll only take a few weeks. Um, so I wanted to turn the YM2612, steal the YM2612 out of a Sega Genesis and turn it into a standalone hardware synthesizer. So this is another wonderful iPad illustration. I wanted to be able to control my hardware synthesizer from my computer over MIDI. If you don't know what MIDI is, that's cool. It's the protocol that music hardware uses to talk to each other. So it can send note on messages. So if I press a key here, it sends a note on message to my computer. And then my computer relays that note on message to the synthesizer. And then the synthesizer makes noise. So it's like. Cool. Um, that's how MIDI works. And that's what I wanted to build. I was like, all right, cool. That's what we want to do. So let's dive into this. So looking at what actually goes into the hardware module itself is we're going to have a microcontroller. And that microcontroller is going to be talking to the computer over USB. And then it's also going to be talking to the YM2612. So the microcontroller's job is to translate MIDI into stuff that the YM2612 understands. And we don't need any other hardware from the Genesis. We just need that sound chip. So this is easy, right? All we have to do is learn how to talk to the audio chip. Well, it turns out it's not that easy. The YM2612 basically works as a, as a big RAM chip. Um, and this is how a lot of these chips in old consoles worked, is that they were basically just extensions of the CPU's address space. So basically, you write um, values to specific addresses in the chip's RAM, or the chip's uh, address space, and it then uses those values to generate sound. So like one of those registers determines the frequency of each channel, and one of those registers determines whether or not it's playing a sound or not, so the channel on or off. Um, and then there's, because it's FM synthesis, there's a bunch of other parameters that control how the sound, like, sounds. The, the timbre, if you will. So, it works like that, which sounds simple in theory, but it's a very, very fussy chip. Um, this, was, this was the 80s, like, things were different then. So, how do we even start? Right? Like, how do you even get started on this? Because MIDI is complicated. Understanding the YM2612 register map is complicated. What do you do? So I had this idea. I was going to build a proof of concept. And what I was going to do is just get the microcontroller sending some canned data to the YM2612. So I don't have to understand what these registers do. I just have to be able to wire some hardware up and send messages to it. So there's actually a file form for, format for that called VGM. And VGM is sort of like um, that digitized sheet music I mentioned earlier. It is a recording of the, the address and data buses from the Genesis CPU when it's talking to the YM2612. So all the microcontroller has to do is play that back. It looks like this. It's just a series of, of bytes like this that say write to the YM2612, write at this address, and write this value. Cool. If you're wondering what VGM stands for, it stands for video game music, which I think is hysterical because it only works for Sega stuff. So it's from this weird alternate universe where Sega won, and I really like that. <laughs> so proof of concept, let's just get VGM playback working. So this is my first proof of concept. It's an Arduino, and it's wired up to the YM2612. I know this video is really small, but don't worry, it's irrelevant. Um, and then this is what it sounds like. This is the first time I ever got any audio coming out of this thing at all. Look at her go. I'm pretty sure that I like clapped my hands and went, yes, after that. Yeah, um, yes, thank you, Scott. Uh, <laughs> um, concept proved. So that's it, right? We're done. Synthesizer finished. Of course not. Uh, there's still a lot more work to do. Um, from a proof of concept, we go to a prototype, right? Um, so what I wanted to do here was move from like a pile of wires on my desk that is an Arduino and the YM2612 to like some kind of final hardware. So 
I put this all on a breadboard and I moved from Arduino to Teensy 3.5, thank you, Paul, um, which is super awesome. And it is, uh, it has an SD card, which comes in handy later. A lot more speed, a lot more IO. It's, uh, this is the Teensy 3.5, so it works on five volt logic levels, which is great, because that's what the YM2612 works with, so I didn't need logic level shifters. Um, have a display, and I have at the bottom there, that little pur purple board is a, um, a headphone amplifier. And that is the source of all of my problems. Um, at this point, everything still worked, and it still played back VGM files. Cool. So I had a perfectly functional jukebox. And this is where I ran into my first real challenge with this project. The audio coming out of this thing is extremely noisy. And when I gave a practice talk, someone said to me, what is audio noise? And I know this is gonna be a really dated reference, but like, have you ever tried to tune a radio? <laughs> and like, you're in between channels, and it's like, shh, like, it's like that. And it drowns out the signal that you wanna hear. And we have to solve that, because I want to use this as a professional audio synthesizer, so we can't just have this noise drowning out my signal. So, what's causing noise? How do we fix it? That's the question. And I didn't know, because I don't know anything about hardware. This is my first project. I'm a software engineer. When there's noise, I go and blame someone else. Um, so what do you do? Well, I did a bunch of research, and the first thing I found out was that the YM2612 is weird. Who would have thought? Um, the short story is that the audio output coming out of the YM2612 is not quite what you would expect for modern like audio level signals, like the headphone amplifier is expecting a certain impedance, a certain level, and the YM2612 is just not giving it that. So the solution there is to build an amplifier that can work with the YM2612 output. So this is more research. Research is a very good thing to do when you don't know anything. I found a really excellent mod for the Genesis called the Mega Amp. It uses relatively modern audio grade components to create audio, clear audio, from the console that conforms to modern standards. This is an extremely popular mod, and all kinds of people do it because apparently the um, headphone output on the original Genesis is really bad. Um, so yeah, so all I had to do was take the schematic that I could barely read and modify it for my, my synthesizer. Easy, right? Just go and build that. Turns out that like analog circuits are really hard. Up until this point in my like hardware career, um, I'd only worked with digital like stuff, right? Like I've made my Arduino blink a light, and I managed to like proof of concept this YM2612, like an Arduino talking to a YM2612. That was easy compared to building an analog circuit. This is my third attempt, and it's the first one that worked. And this is on a proto board, and yeah, it was really hard. And the problem is like I didn't know how to debug this. I had to learn how to do that. I had to um, guess and like be like, okay, well maybe I get this capacitor backwards or, or like maybe I managed to fry the IC when I was soldering it on. I just didn't know what I was doing. So yeah, that was hard, but I finally got it to work. And then I moved everything else onto proto boards as well. And I was like, man, that looks slick. <laughs> um, so noise is gone, right? No, absolutely not. Things were less noisy, but still like unbearably noisy, not something I'd want to use in a professional audio setting. So, back to research, right? I made good progress, but I, needed, I wanted to go further here. I really wanted to get, get rid of this noise altogether. So I did some research, and it turns out there's a lot of noise sources for analog circuits. Uh, breadboards and poter boards act like big antennas, and they just soak up electromagnetic interference. So that could be a problem. The USB power supply is notoriously noisy, and any noise in the power supply will be noise in your, uh, your audio circuit, so cool. The thing that I'm using to power this project isn't working. The Teensy has a switching regulator on it, and that's wonderful for uh, efficiency, but it's not as great for audio. The display has a buck regulator, a buck boost regulator, and it is awful for audio. So we gotta fix that. I, I didn't want to try to fix all of this, right? I didn't want to try to redesign the Teensy to not use a switching regulator. So I decided to do two things, to use a separate external power supply. Um, so I'm using a nine volt power supply, and it goes into two separate linear regulators on my board. 
one side for the analog side of things and one side for the digital side of things. And this is enough isolation to eliminate um, noise from the power supply and from the switching regulators on the, uh, on the teensy in the display. And the other thing I decided to do was eliminate protoboards, which is exactly what I used to build my project. So I know what you're all thinking right now is, wait, how would you eliminate the thing that you built your project on? You just learn how to make PCBs, of course, because <laughs> it's that easy. It's just so simple. As a beginner, and like as a, just a total noob to hardware, I was like, that's not possible, right? Like you have to like you have to like go to college or something for this, or like at least take an online course. Um, it turns out I do actually know nothing, and it's really actually very approachable to design your own PCB. Um, there's excellent free software. I use KiCad. And there's cheap prototyping services out there. I'm not going to name any names because you all know them all. Um, and I watched a video series from DigiKey with Sean in it. So I know Sean's around here somewhere. So thank you, Sean. Um, and yeah, I drew up the PCBs for this. And I actually learned a really neat trick while I was researching this, which is to print your PCBs out on paper and then use that to test your component sizes before you order them. Because that way you don't have to wait like two weeks before you find out that you made a mistake. I still made mistakes. but it helped me cut down on the number of mistakes. So this is what one of the PCBs looks like for the synth um, in KiCad. This is the motherboard. And on the side here is the Teensy. On the, in the middle there is the YM2612. And at the top is the two voltage regulators that I mentioned. And then here's all three of them fresh from the PCB manufacturer. And this is the front and the back. Um, so like uh, the one furthest away is the display board. The one in the middle is the motherboard that you just saw. And the one closest to the camera is the audio board. So yeah, I actually designed the audio board first because I don't have any sense. It's the most complicated one, and I designed it first. I have no explanation for why I did that. Um, and then you just put it all together, right? And it's going to work the first time. It actually did work the first time. <laughs> Legitimately the only thing that went right in this project. And subsequent projects that I've done now that I've fallen in love with hardware have not worked out that way. Um, and so I laser cut a nice acrylic case for it, and now it's a beautiful synthesizer. Nice, huh? All right, but we forgot about something. Software. <laughs> Up until this point, it's a beautiful jukebox. It plays VGM, but I don't want to use VGM. I don't want a jukebox. I want a synthesizer, so it needs to learn MIDI. So going back to what we talked about earlier, the path to that is that we need to teach the Teensy how to turn MIDI into stuff that the YM2612 understands. And the problem is, though, is that the YM2612 has no documentation. Because why would it be documented? Like, not even from Yamaha themselves. Uh, I emailed them about this, and apparently they're too busy making jet skis to write documentation. Um, that's what they said. Uh, so obviously, you turn to reverse engineering at this point, right? Because um, that's my specialty, it's reverse engineering. I'm kidding. Most of the secrets here have been discovered by others. The problem is that the resources that are out there for the YM2612 are great if you want to write a Sega Genesis emulator, or if you want to write Homebrew, a game for the Sega Genesis. But they make all kinds of assumptions about hardware that just are not true. So they're not great for learning how to actually speak to a real chip. So what do we do? Well, I mentioned that the YM2612 is part of a bigger family of chips, right? There was one in the DX7 that had more operators and stuff. It turns out some of those chips have manuals, and that's wonderful. Because they're all from the same family and share lineage, they should have the same electrical and timing characteristics. Cool. The problem is, is that Yamaha is also too busy making pianos <laughs> to write their manuals in English. <laughs> and I don't know any Japanese. Um, so I did not learn how to, how to read Japanese for this project. I thankfully have some friends that, uh, that helped me out. But it still came down to a lot of trial and error. I legitimately had a, a loop and a button at one point where when I'd press a button, it would make the write cycle slightly longer until things started working. It works. I don't know what to say. And this is like, I finally got it working. And this is kind of like what translating one message looks like to the Teensy. You get MIDI in, which is note on, which I showed you all earlier. The Teensy has to assign one of the six channels, has to calculate the frequency and block number, which is a 
a special weirdness of the YM2612, and it has to send that data to the YM2612, and then it has to turn the channel on. And what the YM2612 sees is just these three writes. Um, like the first two bytes there are the frequency, and the last byte there just turns the channel on. So that's what we get. But a synth needs to do more than just make noise. It needs to be usable as an instrument. There was so much more involved in the software that I wish I could go into here. And surprisingly, despite me being a software engineer, the software took me way longer than the hardware. And I, I still make tweaks to it. Like every time I do a cover of another song using the synthesizer, I'm like, oh, it'd be really cool to have this feature make covering this song so much easier. So I'm still making changes to it. Um, the software has evolved more than the hardware at this point. Um, so yeah, so that brings us to here and now. And I guess I showed you earlier, this is the completed synthesizer and it's upside down. Um, so use your imagination and flip it right side up. And how would y'all feel about making some music together? Cool beans. That still works. That's a great sign. How are we looking on time? Five minutes. Perfect. All right, so we got five minutes. Let's make a song in five minutes. Before I make a song for y'all, I want to show you that this thing can sound like a lot of different stuff. So let's start with an organ sound, because I, I think some of you may like Castlevania or something. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Um, some of y'all like Zelda, right? Streets of Rage. Streets of Rage. I'm not that good at piano. <laughs> so yeah, sacrilege to play a Nintendo song in a Sega synthesizer, right? Um, but let's talk about some fun stuff. So I wanted to, to do a sort of nine, early 90s inspired song for y'all for this demo. So I got some really like early 90s beats for y'all. So let's play this, let's play this drum beat. All right, this is my drum beat. Pretty simple, right? I don't want to do anything complicated for y'all. Cool, all right, so first thing you need if you're gonna make a early 90s influenced synth song is bass. So I'm gonna find a bass patch. That's pretty good. That's pretty chunky. All right, let's do some bass. And I may mess this up, but it's okay, I have backups. All right, cool, that's our bass. So the synthesizer can do some nice bass for you. Stop, thank you. Okay. So on top of our bass, we need some chords, right? Like every like early 90s song needs like some smooth cordage. So let's listen to a couple things. Closer. I like that. What do y'all think? All right, cool. Let's put some chords on it then. Don't laugh, don't laugh yet. Like, you're gonna throw me off. <laughs> Some of you are quick studies, but for your friends that may be behind, please don't give it away yet. There's one more part we need to do. One second. Okay. So obviously this formative track 
needs a melody, and it needs to be something memorable, something that you would maybe send your friends without prompting or tell them that it's something else. <laughs> or trick an entire conference into listening to it. I think that's a pretty good sound for it. What do y'all think? All right, let's do it. Okay, are y'all okay? How are you doing? You've all just been rickrolled. And I really wanna thank you all for being just such good sports about it. Again, I wanna thank the Hackaday crew for enabling me to rickroll all of you. Um, this is really wonderful. As I mentioned, all of this is open source. You can find me on the internet there. Um, if you have questions about it, please come find me afterwards. I'm happy to show you the synthesizer. Um, and yeah, would love to answer any questions about it, um, just not on stage. Um, thank you all so much, and hopefully this has inspired you to make some hardware synthesizers. <laughs> <laughs>